Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Toby Roberts. I am a uh, media planner. I've been a media planner for almost 20 years now. Uh, so I've seen a lot of change. I've seen a lot of change in what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. But I would like to say that I think that is just a fraction of what we're going to see in the next five to 10 years. And that's the topic that I was briefed to talk about, media technology and the future of marketing. That's quite a lot to cover. I hope I'll be able to do it justice uh, in, in, in the sort of next 30 to 40 minutes. So I'm going to start by talking kind of about what we all already know, because the other speakers have mentioned it. Uh, 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 and you will work in media and marketing, so you will know this as well. But we're spending more time in digital worlds. Uh, this is data from the US that shows just between 2014 and 2018, there's an almost 50% rise in the time that people spend with digital. And that's in a very developed market like the US. Some countries are going to be seeing dramatic change. I've just pulled out here Brazil, India, and compared them to the US. By next year, more people will be online in India than are online in America. And of course, what's driving this, as you've heard before, is smartphone growth. E-Marketer predicts remarkably that by 2019, 40% of the world's population will have a smartphone, which is a staggering, staggering statistic. And of course, what's driving that within mobile is the adoption of social media. By 2019, we're going to be seeing over 2.4 billion people connected to social platforms of some sort or another. To put that in context, that's about a third of the world's population by 2019. And what that means for us is that within that growing digital space, we're also seeing fragmentation and splintering of activity across all sorts of different uh, environments. And what that means as a media planner is that it's getting harder and harder and harder to buy cost-effective, impactful reach, what are the lifeblood of what our clients uh, depend on. Coupled with the fact that money is pouring into this new space, so demand fragments and splinters and is growing, so as does supply. So the net result of all of this, from my perspective, and from a marketer's perspective, is that we've got different channels. We've got different ad units. We've got different buying events. We've got different target potential. We've got huge budget implications, not just for how, where we spend media dollars, but what the implications of that are on non-working media. So what does a production budget look like in this new world? We already saw the example from Facebook earlier, from those people that saw it, where different TV copy is versioned into N different types for different audiences. That has huge impact on the ratio between non-working and working media budgets. And the net result of all of this is there is an elevated chance for inefficient payback within marketing. And that's what we're all about. We're about investing money for a payback for our clients. It's going to be much easier to get this wrong in the future. So we've got to really watch out for that. Hidden within all this change, though, is something that has even bigger implications for how we uh, move forward in this world. And that, of course, is the rise of programmatic. Now, in developed markets, we're already seeing this hitting about 50%. Uh, E-Marketer are predicting that over the next two to three years, most digital display, about 70% of digital display, will be driven by programmatic. We traded programmatically through private marketplaces. It's also going to start extending out into other channels, into native, into video, into digital out of home. Everything is increasingly moving to a programmatic world. And this is a recognition that the complexity of this new landscape and the data that we use to navigate it is simply becoming too much for humans to be able to handle. What we're increasingly relying on is machines that can process enormous amounts of data at speed to be able to action the media strategies and the marketing strategies that we come up with. And a good analogy to this, of course, is the change in financial services going back to the 1980s when the Big Bang happened and the financial markets moved from sort of standing up open outcry trading to screen-based computer trading. Suddenly, they were using data and algorithms to start moving positions through the financial market. It's taken us 30 years to catch up. But what you're now seeing, of course, across Wall Street and the London Stock Exchange is algo trading, trading driven by 
artificial intelligence, which sits within financial markets, makes sense of this data that's out there and presents it back to humans in a manageable form that they can use to make decisions on. Should be a video playing there. <laughs> oh. Yes, no. And I said, oh, because those have been in the news lately. Um, and I said, I said, how does that work? And he said, well, there's 2,000 physicists on Wall Street now, and I'm one of them. And I said, well, so what's the black box for Wall Street? And he said, well, it's funny that you asked that because it's actually called black box trading. And it's also sometimes called algo trading, algorithmic trading. And algorithmic trading evolved in part because institutional traders have the same problems that the United States Air Force had, which is that they're moving these positions, whether it's Procter & Gamble or Accenture or whatever, they're moving like a million shares of something through the market. And if they do that all at once, it's like playing poker and just going all in right away, right? You just tip your hand. And so they have to find a way, and they use algorithms to do this, to break up that big thing into a million little transactions. And the magic and the horror of that is, is that the same math that you use to break up the big thing into a million little things can be used to find a million little things and sew them back together and figure out what's actually happening in the market. So if you need to have some image of what's happening in the stock market right now, what you can picture is a bunch of algorithms that are basically programmed to hide and a bunch of algorithms that are programmed to go find them and act. And all of that's great and it's fine and that's 70% of the United States stock market, 70% of the operating system formerly known as your pension, <laughs> your, your mortgage. Okay, so that was Kevin Slevin from MIT, a TED talk he did some time ago now. You probably most of you have seen it. I think it was in 2012. Uh, but he was talking about how financial markets are using algorithms to decode or try and decode incredibly complex data that exists out there and do it at speed. And he has this lovely phrase for it. He says, we've got to the stage now where we're writing the unreadable and we can't process this amount of information at a human level ourselves. And this is basically where we're heading. If we think about the changes from the computer age in the 1950s through to the network age in the 80s, to the dawning of the data age in the 2000s, the growth of this data in what we do is getting to the stage where we are now doing the same thing. We are basically writing the unreadable. And what's going to help us do this, what's going to help us decode this, is the rise of a new utility. And that uh, utility is artificial intelligence. According to Kevin Kelly of Wired, the AI future is starting now to come into view. And it's not scary AI like Rutger Hauer in Blade Runner or how in 2000, actually, it is simple utility. It looks a lot like Amazon Web Services. It's cheap, industrial grade, digital smartness that runs everything we kind of do and is completely invisible apart from when it kind of blinks off. Like all utilities, it's actually going to be very, very boring, even as it kind of transforms the internet, the global economy, and the way that we work within this landscape. Now, why talk about this? Oh, excuse me. It's an old version of my presentation. <laughs> why talk about this now? Well, there are some big headlines coming up, of course. We've all heard about face uh, recognition algorithms. We've all heard about self-driving cars. But actually, the three things that are pulling all this together is what you'd call unstructured data. So the stunning growth, availability, and use of information. There's much more of it, uh, and it's coming at us from all angles, from all different sources. And the fact that we can now store, of it, store more of it than ever before means it's worth trying to make sense of. Now, you've all heard the statistic that I think 90% of all the data in the world has been generated in the last two years. The problem, of course, is that only a tiny fraction of it is numeric. So it's really difficult for us to start pulling out insight and trying to understand the rest. And that's where artificial intelligence starts to come in. The increasingly 
uh, sophistication uh, of algorithms, of deep learning algorithms that can t be set up to teach themselves how to perform and optimize tasks is becoming more and more and more sophisticated. And again, we'll start to take over the marketing machine, as I'll touch on in a second. And also increasing computational speed uh, means that we can actually process all this stuff in real time to ensure that we're executing correctly. If we look at the investments in AI, according to an EU research document uh, released uh, uh, earlier this year, whilst investment in AI was about 700 million euros in 2013, that's going to, by the end of this year, hit 27 billion in terms of R&D. And the people who are investing in it are the giants. IBM, Google, Facebook. IBM, you've probably heard about. They've already invented a thing called Watson. Watson very famously in 2011 in the States beat the champions of Jeopardy, which was a game show, and really kind of showed the world how far AI had come. Now, what they've been doing with Watson since then is even more interesting. They set up a billion dollar unit to commercialize this technology. Watson Analytics, you can see adverts for them in The Economist and The Week. What they've done uh, is they have uh, helped the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York process data to look for cancer cures. They've helped the ANZ Bank try to find algorithms to help individuals with wealth management. And actually, the future of technology like Watson might be just providing behind-the-scenes intelligence for a whole new generation of applications that we're only just kind of beginning to imagine. Google, uh, last year, bought a company called DeepMind Technologies, a British AI company. It was only three years old. Um, they claim that they're uh, absolutely at cutting edge because the intelligence they're building is not pre-programmed. It learns at a raw pixel level how to perform particular tasks. I don't know if anyone has seen it, but if you go online and look for the videos of their algorithms teaching themselves to play computer games, they are astonishing. All they do is say, optimize this number, the score, and leave the system to learn across all these different games how to beat the system. This is the sort of thing that's going to be running our lives, it's going to be running our devices, it's going to be running our media consumption, and it's going to be running our marketing machine as we move forward. Because this AI trade, it's not just heading for us, it's going to pass right through our backyard. This is what's going to make a bigger impact on our business of media and marketing than the advent of the internet. So, what is this radical reorganization of marketing? What is it going to look like? Well, I'm going to consider it from kind of two angles. First is how AI will impact the marketing machine, kind of what the people in this room do and are responsible for. And I think that's a bit clearer, because we can already see the start of that now. We can see the direction uh, of travel. There's another angle, which is how AI will impact the way consumers interact with the world around them. And I think that's harder to judge, but I do think there are some precedents that we can draw out. And finally, I'm going to have a think about that within that future, what might advertising and commercial models look like what might media planning and media activation look like in this new world going forward? So if we think for a minute about the kind of data that we currently use, obviously we've got our DMPs, we've got DSPs, we start looking at our web and social analytics, we've got our attribution models online, increasingly broadening out to include offline effects, search bid managers, and so on and so on and so on. All this is going to come closer and closer and closer together. And over the next five years, they're just going to become one tech stack, which will be used to implement campaigns. And at this point, kind of who sees what, in what order, across what device, and with what message is going to be largely dictated by these machines. It's going to be largely dictated uh, by algorithms, overseen, of course, by experts and strategists, but executed by machines. In fact, Forrester are already talking about this. Uh, they've talked about adaptive marketing, and this is, a t this is, this is uh, essentially uh, something Forrester Research talk about where you take market-level modeling, uh, macro-level, and that would be offline and external factors, and you combine that, you integrate that with customer-level attribution in digital to get a single view of your marketing activity, which uh, takes account of both short-term sales effects, long-term brand effects, and can then optimize within that going forward. 
The implications for us and what we think about are pretty enormous. There will be no distinction between CRM and media. Basically, all advertising, all communication will be driven uh, by first-party data. It will, that will be what drives all marketing activity as we can increasingly target who and where and when and with what individually. Kind of creative and strategy will emerge from this data as kind of epiphenomena. Instead of being inputs into a linear process, which ends up in a media plan, these will be something that are continually refined, continually adapted as we move through uh, the process. And human intervention will have to simply get out of the way, certainly at the micro-decisioning level, the sort of things that our planners spend their time thinking about now, about channel selection, about formats, about the order in which they see the ads, about reach and frequency against different aggregated groups. That will simply have to get out of the way, and that will all be done by a machine. What instead we're going to be doing instead is we're going to be keeping up to date with the technology. We're going to be analyzing the outputs of that technology. We're going to be advising clients on tech stacks on what we should be looking at within that, as well as building the parameters for optimization. So taking clients' marketing plans and marketing objectives and translating these into strategies which can be delivered in this sort of way. What that means is we're going to need new skill sets kind of in our teams. So. To call them technology architects. It's going to be essential that our client-facing teams know as much about technology tomorrow as they know about media today. So we're going to have to start skilling people up right now uh, to get this right. They're going to have to know about different categorizations, how they all work together, and all the different players in different spaces in marketing. For example, you know, Facebook's new ability uh, to be able to onboard customer data through phone numbers and email addresses instead of just cookie matching is potentially game changing for some of our clients. We need to be able to know about that. We need to be able to be advising the right clients about this at the right time. The ability to import purchase information from a Dunhumby or a Nielsen, again, is game changing for a lot of our clients because suddenly you can serve to people who haven't bought a household detergent, I work on Unilever, who haven't bought a household detergent for the last six weeks and have never bought our brand before. We can target those groups of people in terms of messaging, when to buy, where to buy, and get very, very specific about the objectives of the campaigns. I also think creative is going to be huge. We're at a massive pivot point for what we think of in terms of creative product. Marketing technology is a massive very dynamic canvas for creativity. Sequential cross-device all served to an individual it opens up huge potential for creative product. What I can say is that what we think of as creative product in the form of beautifully crafted 60-second spots is going to have to not change, but it's going to have to be enhanced significantly. And again, we saw, I think we saw a really nice hint of that earlier in the Facebook tool where they talk about versioning, cheaply versioning different uh, creative treatments for different segments and different audiences. And it kind of feels like the marketing community, again, the people in this room, are sort of broadly aware of this direction of travel. They kind of agree with this direction of travel. This was a survey uh, that The Economist did of, 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 of CMOs back in February of this year. And they were very clear about future success residing in smarter application of data and marketing tech. I did, though, want to sound kind of one note of caution here. It's not particularly prevalent in here, but a lot of the language that you read about these new developments uh, in technology talk about engagement. They talk about conversations. They talk about lo loyalty. They talk about dialogue with consumers. Basically, all the things that we were promised 10 years ago in the social media revolution. And that model has, by and large, been a failure. It hasn't worked. It hasn't grown brands. And the reason for that is very, very, very simple. Like it or not, most people don't think or don't really care about the brands that they buy. So this is my one bit of caution. Uh, within this, within this whole, whole space. We have to get used to the idea that this is a human trait. 
People not really caring, not really thinking about, not having the cognitive bandwidth to think about brands very much is just part of the human condition today. It's not something that we're going to solve with greater ad tech sophistication. That's just the way the kind of world is. Because we have to remember that in this kind of rush to the future, we're not the only people who are going to be deploying technology. The consumers are going to be deploying technology as well. And the AI revolution will also impact how consumers will kind of reach out into the mass of media options and bring it back to themselves. The best exemplar of this is probably going to be the rise of the VPA. Or if you like, the virtual personal assistant. This could be a single app or it could be a suite of apps. Um, but basically, this will be the bridge between the consumer and the world around them. At present, they exist, but they're pretty weak in their uh, AI functionality, like if you take Siri, for example. But kind of given the pace of change in this whole space, which I'll touch on in a sec, we're not far from having uh, a personal assistant that sits on a device that's not far from being a kind of sentient mind that actually spends its time organizing your life for you. And not just in terms of media, though that's a big part of it, but it organizes your life, your behaviors, making everything easier and removing boundaries. And these VPAs will become much more than the kind of walled gardens that they, that they currently are. They will be open source VPAs. They can, they can scan the tagged up world in the same way uh, that we opened up websites to, to search engines 20 years ago. And this is what this company, Viv, are working on creating. I don't know if you've heard of Viv. You're all kind of tech entrepreneurs, so you, pr you probably have. Uh, but these guys first came together at the research institute, SRI International, as part of a DARPA-funded project called Kalo, or Cognitive Assistant that Learns and Organizes. Um, having developed this technology, they then had the idea, or one of them, Dag Kitlaus, had the idea of using Kalo as the foundation of a VPA that would sit within smartphones. And of course, the rest is history. It became Siri. Uh, they released their first, uh, they, they released their first uh, iPhone app in 2010 and then were immediately bought by Apple, who integrated Siri into, uh, into the iPhone. But wh whilst they were doing that, they also scaled back, or so the guys from Viv claim, a lot of the capabilities that existed within Siri in the first place. So what these guys are now working on uh, is a much more open source uh, personal assistant assistant, which would sit within a mobile device. And the way they talk about it, though they are being quite tight-lipped about it, is that basically it's a piece of technology that other people can build on top of, much like Watson or much like some of the DeepMind, uh, DeepMind stuff. Again, Dad Kitlaus, who runs Viv, explains that you could use his technology to run a smart travel agent. They could white-label it out to a travel company, uh, which would then respond to a, a, a simple voice command to find me a good deal to go to uh, the Caribbean with my children at Easter. And it would then go out and find that information for you. In short, what these companies are, uh, are creating is, is the background for a new generation of applications that are able to understand kind of what a user is actually looking for and why they're, they're looking for it. The first, you know, the, the, the first the race to create this you know, is still kind of a long way off. But one thing everyone kind of agrees on is that these kind of uh, intelligent devices are here to stay and are going to be increasingly part of the way consumers edit the world around them. So they will be removing barriers between our entertainment, our information, our communication, all the things that we think about as media at the moment. They will manage this mass of information for an individual and just play it back to them in the form of an application. So where does this leave what we do? Where does this leave advertising opportunities? Well, some of this is likely to stay as a simple paid for model. Premium entertainment products will still be paid for by consumers in, in the way kind of, uh, it is now. But based on what we've seen over the last decade, most of the kind of information access and social connection products which will be part of this are probably going to be supported by advertising and data-led uh, opportunities. So if we start thinking about what that might look like, we can start to sketch out maybe what some of the advertising opportunities of five years, 10 years down the track are going to look like, and therefore, the sort of skills we need to start building now to make sure that we're ready to take advantage of these. So the simple relationship between 
this application and the user will bring in new forms of advertising that you might think of as kind of biddable serendipity. If you imagine, for example, a real world PA signing off about my trip to Berlin, saying, right, you're booked on these flights, your car's picking up, here's where you might like to go for dinner. By the way, that shirt you were looking at last week, that's in the sale now and they've got your size. And don't forget to buy something for your wife when you go back through duty free tonight and would you like to order me for it? These are all prompts, these are all opportunities uh, that we could bid for on a PPC search model. The messages will be created algorithmically in a completely kind of natural and, and, and native way and delivered when your kind of quality or relevance score and your bid price ratio tips a, a certain threshold. And you could also think about how social communication is augmented in the same way that, for example, Emu, another company bought by Google, was starting to explore in Instant Messenger last year. You could add that you could use a, a, a VPA or an application to add information uh, uh, to enhance conversations. And again, here, you're starting to get into a quite a compelling ad model uh, for, the, for the future. So for example, if I am speaking about a TV show called, a TV show called Black Mirror, an intelligence could easily pick up, an application could easily pick up the fact that that was made by a guy called Charlie Brooker, that he's actually written a load of other stuff, and maybe certain other people in my interest graph have also liked those particular shows. Would I like to uh, consume it? There'll be much more to it, of course, than just these sorts of prompts, just these kind of bids, a little bit like, like search. The increasing use of semantic data uh, which we struggle at the moment to, uh, to, to derive insight from, coupled with these kind of standard, more standard approaches, numeric approaches, will start to provide very rich data on the propensities for each audience uh, for purchasing different categories, not based just on behavior, but for the first time, you know, knowing uh, based on their knowledge, their opinions, the conversations that they've had. And this has a whole new dimension for segmentation and, and targeting. Excuse me. And this level of data will allow for the ad advent of what you might think of as preemptive marketing, where individuals are identified as high potentials based on patterns of behavior that are far too complex for humans to identify on their own. It's really interesting being in the main room. Earlier, where I heard, heard credit tech saying about how they can predict someone's credit worthiness on non-credit scores by looking at where they shop and where they go and their sorts of behaviors. These sorts of things would, would not be possible without algorithmic and machine, uh, machine learning. But what this will finally do is let uh, data strategies become much more sophisticated. You know, at present, agencies will select kind of cookie pools of data uh, you know, based on, on, on click-based behavior from the, from the last, uh, uh, last few days or weeks with no real understanding uh, w of whether that audience has fulfilled on a purchase or what they actually think about the brands uh, and the products involved. And winning the ability to be the kind of suggested brand or product to these prospects as they pop into that high propensity active use state will become an area of increasing focus uh, for marketers. Now, we talked a little bit about how decisioning would get outsourced from media agencies uh, to machines. But if you, and if you start with the, uh, you know, the scenario that our VPAs or our suite of applications will be tasked with carrying out lots of our kind of day-to-day -day tasks for us, you quickly get to the realization that actually these applications will increasingly start making decisions on which brand, uh, brands and products we're going to see. Um, so a focus for marketing is going to be how we influence the algorithms and ensure that the, these applications are surfacing up our brands ahead of our competitions. If we take the example, for example, uh, of aggregator sites like Priceline, who I think are here today, or Money Supermarket, who got mentioned this morning. Today, these companies spend an awful lot of money advertising to drive traffic. If you've got an application or an AI assistant which is automatically checking every vendor for you for the best deals, the end consumer doesn't need to see those ads. There is no point in spending money reaching that audience. And it's probably going to go even further than this. As, the, as, as they take on even more tasks, our choices and preferences will start to be learned through the device, allowing preemptive decisions to be made on our behalf, particularly in kind of low interest, low involvement 
uh, categories. The AI device will be able to sift through all the metadata that brands put out there and just make a decision for you. It will also be able uh, to respond to changing behaviors. If, for example, you started making more ethical choices about the food you bought, if you suddenly started be, being concerned about provenance, it could take that and mirror it across different product categories. So start to surface different brands and start to make decisions for you uh, uh, in, in, in those spaces. Now, this sounds like quite a long way in the future, potentially, but this isn't going to work unless kind of marketers and agencies are on board with opening up access to these sorts of AI assistants, all the data that exists about their products. And it needs to be tagged like content uh, uh, is optimized uh, for search on a web page. In fact, I'd imagine that most of this data is probably out there already. It just needs to be aggregated and put in one place and made discoverable. So we're going to clearly need to adapt what we do in all of this. Instead of just looking to influence the consumer, we're going to have to influence the gatekeeper. We're going to have to influence the algorithm that allows us to get to the consumer in the most relevant and cost-effective way. And we're going to have to think about how we market to machines in the same way that we optimize search, and we think about SEO and how we optimize visibility uh, on Google. We're going to need to think about how we optimize for applications, optimize for virtual personal assistants. It's likely that uh, this was going to re uh, require optimizing review data and sentiment data, uh, for example, because that's probably going to be one of the biggest contributions to something that can break through uh, a, 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 a VPA's wall garden and get your quality and relevance score up so you can be surfaced. And in obtaining positive uh, sentiment for consumers will then become a huge determinant of success. These sorts of things were talked about just 10 years ago as the future of advertising reviews, sentiments online. Actually, you now be, might be in a position where you can fulfill that potential because you're now going to have devices, you're now going to have machines that are capable of reading and aggregating that data and presenting it back to consumers in a way that makes sense. And in this kind of world, you start to think, well, what about broadcast? What about outreach? Where does that go? We just had the, uh, the TV guy talking. But in this sort of world where we're spending more and more effort optimizing our presence on machines, the role for broadcast kind of outreach advertising starts to become a bit clearer. There's one role, the first role, which is going to be about influencing sentiment, influencing reviews. The key, the key KPI of that activity is going to be positive mentions of the brand across text or voice communications. The more noise that's out there, the more data that these applications can crunch, the more likely it is we'll get surfaced up. We'll make it through the barrier. So if this happens, you know, expect to see dramatic increases in quotes, reviews, qualified endorsement happening in broadcast advertising. But aside from this, of course, there's still going to be an important role for classic brand-based, brand-building communications. Um, these will be higher interest decisions, but they will also be about building preference in the mind uh, of, of consumers. But this activity will seem very, very different from the other stuff that we, that, we look, that, that, that we look at out there. The broadcast activity is going to be about building fame, about building talkability in a way that's probably much more ambitious than it is today. It would have kind of almost disconnected itself from the world of marketing, the world of propositions, the world of main points that we have to communicate to consumers, and will be much more akin to entertainment. It will be harder to discern the difference between kind of branded platforms and entertainment platforms. And the classic audio-visual ad will start to become more of a brand spectacle. Emotionally powerful brand communication will widely understood, as it is today, to be the most efficient way of driving long-term payback. And it will be obsessed within our own attribution models our own on to offline attribution models. And where we'll get to is we'll get to a kind of emotion war. If you watch the Super Bowl, if you watch the Champions League final, you already start to see the beginning of where this is going to start going as these brands compete for a bigger share and really hit us uh, uh, in the heart and make us feel differently. It's going to be like the Super Bowl, but on steroids. A specific platforms 
are identified as driving mass reach and talkability and branded entertainment platforms just flood into that space. So, things are changing pretty rapidly. I've covered in 40 minutes probably about four hours worth of content. So apologies if I rushed through it. But we do need to act now. There is huge potential out there in terms of building our own technological capability. We have to get better at doing that, but also in terms of how we think about target audiences going forward. We're thinking about the combination of marketing to machines. What can we learn from how we currently think of a search optimization and think about application optimization as we move forward? There will be combinations of purchases which are just done purely by machine, on behalf of a consumer. There will be different purchases which will involve a little bit of both. So there'll be some human input and there'll be some machine input. There will still, of course, be uh, purchases for which we actually have to get through to the human who can override any rational machine piece of learning and make a purely emotional purchase. Getting the balance right between those three approaches is going to be critical as we move forward into the future. It's pretty exciting, so let's seize it now. That's it from me. <laughs> Any questions, thoughts, observations? Have we got time? Five minutes, I think. Stunned silence. Sorry. Yeah, 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 you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, first of all, uh, okay. First of all, uh, I'm from Hero Media. We are video SSP, which means that we are just in the other end of the value chain than the agencies. And I really like the vision that you presented and the discussion about, artificial, about AI, and we agree with you with this. I think there is a currently a challenge in the market, which, if it will not be solved, could um, make hurdles in the way to, get you to uh, bring your vision. And the problem is that uh, we, as SSP, don't receive any uh, data re uh, uh, requests from the ads. That means, take our company as an example, we have a reach of 110 million people. Probably we have any kind of a profile that you as an advertiser will be interested. But we don't get the information from the advertisers. Not only us, no one in the SSP side gets it. It gets stuck in the DSP. So what happens is that this is one of the least uh, optimal uh, ecosystem that there are because actually what we do in our company we reverse engineer the ads. That means we say, hmm, we have here an ad of PNG, which means that probably it's targeted to female, so let's try to target them to female. Whereas if someone would tell us, well, they want female from a Berlin area that finished the first degree or whatever, it will be very easy for us to send it to you, and then your work will be much easier, and also our work will be much efficient. Mm -hmm. The question is, why don't we get this kind of information? <laughs> why don't why it, you play with us? It's like a game of hide and seek. Yeah, it's it's a it's a it's a really good question, and we are still you know we are still at the very early days of this, uh, or, you know of the of this journey. What I find with uh, you know a lot of the, of the of the clients that I deal with is that they're fiercely protective of their data. They don't want it getting out there. A lot of people are building their own platforms. A lot of clients are building their own platforms, which hold data within it. What they don't want to do is get to the point of view, get to the point where they're they're sharing that with too many third parties, inc including including us. Oh, sorry, right, I missed. It. Yeah. Okay, yeah, and again, and again, I think there's, there's a mindset shift that needs to happen, probably within agencies in, in particular, but also with, uh, within clients that, you know, we're, and we wrestle with this uh, with, with, uh, with Unilever. At what point do you switch from saying, right, I just want, I, you know, I sell Omo washing powder. I just want all, I just want any woman with a washing machine, any person with a washing machine, excuse me, uh, in, my, in my target audience. 
How do I enhance that with data and information? And what's the premium that I have to pay to do that? That's the trade-off that people, I think, are working out at the moment, because greater targeting should command a premium, and often does command a premium uh, when, we, you know, when, when we trade it. This sounds like a sell pitch. Let, we, let's have a chat about this afterwards. So that, there was a guy over there, but I think he might have left. Okay, never mind. Thank you very much, everyone. Enjoy the rest of the show.